Hello again, everyone. Um, one of my roles um, as a public health physician um, for the Bay of Plenty and Lakes is, is about um, promoting health and also um, protecting health. And um, in this session, I, I really wanted to bring that focus to the, this discussion on biophilic thinking. Stand closer to the mic. Is that better? I might take it off. Is that better? Yeah. And um, so it's really looking at a lot of these ideas around biophilia, biophilic design, and biophilic cities from a public health point of view. And it, it's about this notion that um, really for people to be healthy and thriving, we need healthy, thriving nature. And uh, just before we carry on, there's one other um, aspect of the conference that I wanted to mention, and that is we have a vision board um, to your right, out near the tea and coffee area. And it's really about that, that vision for a thriving, flourishing um, Bay of Plenty. And the idea of the vision board is just to go and put up words that, for you, would uh, capture what a thriving Bay of Plenty region would look like in terms of thriving people and thriving nature. So over the course of the day and over, over lunch and the afternoon tea break, be sure to add some words um, to, that, to that board so that we can start creating a, a word picture about a, th a thriving um, Bay of Plenty. Okay, I've got quite a few slides and not that much time. So the idea is to cover ideas and um, a, a lot of breadth and um, there's certainly enough depth there that we can drill down as we need it. So, um, I've called my talk Reimagining Health for People and Planet. And it's really trying to make a transformation or transition in our thinking from really what has become, what has been 20th century thinking to what we need in the 21st century as we go, go through a bottleneck really with, um, in terms of you know, the loss of species, a lot of loss of genetic diversity. And we look at how we can um, start rethinking how we, how, we, how we do things. And I just wanted to start with this idea about what creates health. This is a diagram we refer to a lot in public health. It's um, called the social and economic determinants of health. It's all those factors um, that in our broader environment, um, going from the sort of social, economic, and cultural and environmental um, conditions right through to the individual, all these factors that, that um, influence us and help create health or, or not. And what's really interesting from a public health point of view, if we look at what influences health outcomes, most of it, 60%, is outside the individual and outside the health system. So in public health, we try to look at that, that inter interface between health and, and, uh, and, and all that wider environment of the factors that influence health. And obviously now, this biophilic thinking fits into that space. I want to suggest that we might be at a point of peak human health. The human population is healthier than ever before. If we look at all the key grand sort of overarching markers of health, we're doing better than ever before. Life expectancy is on average increasing globally. On average poverty is decreasing and a key indicator of, of health, child mortality, is on average decreasing. Now, in public health, we're very aware of differences and disparities within countries and between countries and so on. But this is a global picture um, of, <coughs> of what, we're, how we're progressing a, as a species. Things are getting better, but things are also getting worse. And this is from the, uh, the recent um, uh, Lancet and Rockefeller Commission on, on Planetary Com Commission on Planetary Health. And, and if we look at all these ecological and environmental indicators, things are getting worse. And I think everyone's kind of aware of, of, of this. It's just interesting to see how it's accelerating in, in, in recent decades. And we, we get a lot of reports that are quite difficult reading and quite depressing. And the most recent one, a uh, uh, report on the state of uh, global biodiversity, uh, essentially it shows that um, we're losing species at an increasingly rapid rate and these these species and ecosystems are basically are on what life and our health and well-being depends 
So right now we're in a, in a st stage where we, we've managed to overcome many of the population health issues that relate to infectious disease and so on. And we're dealing with chronic diseases mostly, um, uh, car cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, these long-term conditions, mental health is, as you wears an important public health issue, inequities in health, these are all key issues. And we're facing a future where we, we go, we're, we're likely to start seeing impacts on health from these ecological drivers such as loss of bio species and biodiversity, climate disruption, uh, water stress and land and soil degradation and so on. And so we created this ecological debt and are likely to experience in the future impacts on population health related to these. So I, I'd say we are at this point of peak human health um, and um, there's an increasing concern ab about this link between health and well-being of other species. We did a survey in 2016 that looked at a whole lot of issues around public health and one of the questions we asked was, what was your level of concern in terms of your impact uh, on health and well-being related to a number of things? And people rated the loss of native species as one of the key concerns in terms of the impact on health and well-being. And I thought that really captured this idea of biophilia, this link um, between health and well-being and, um, and, and, and um, the environment. Jan has covered the biophilia hypothesis in quite some detail and I just wanted to sum it up in a few statements. Um, Edward Wilson, who really coined the phrase as we're using it now, described it as, as the innately emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms. Stephen Keller, to, who wrote extensively on this topic, and you've heard quite a lot about Stephen Keller from Jana, uh, spoke about biophilic design, uh, meaning to uh, enhance the connection um, between enhance human health and well-being by fostering connections between people and nature in the built environment. Or more simply, it's a love, awe and respect of all things living. Biophilic design and architecture has really developed over quite a few decades. It's quite a ma mature field now. I think it's, um, it's been uh, um, developing perhaps over the last two or three decades. One of the early studies was by Ulrich, which was a study looking at patients recovering from surgery. So patients who had a view of just a concrete wall out their window compared to patients who had views of trees. Um, and th those that had views of tr trees and, and greenery had rec recovered faster, got discharged earlier, and fewer, at, at less um, need for pain relief. So it's this whole idea about connecting people with nature, and it includes a whole lot of elements like plants and water, natural light, and ventilation, natural shapes and forms, and we can also include all those other principles about eco-design in terms of energy efficiency and so on. Um, a great publication is the 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design, which goes into this in a lot of detail. You can download it off the internet, there's a public, it's, it's on the book table as well, that describes this in a, in a lot of detail. We know when we don't have biophilic design, and having worked in hospitals, and that these, this is from our local hospital here, this is not biophilic design, and it's, it's really, no, it's, 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 it's quite, no, these environments that have no natural light and no sense of anything living are, are really difficult places to work. And as soon as we have plants in a place, and we brought a few in today, now psychologically we think, yep, yeah, there's something living and, th and thriving in that place, and it's, 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 it has that reassuring ef effect for us. We do have an amazing building, um, uh, the Kathleen Kilgore uh, uh, Radiotherapy Centre that's got this green wall and um, especially for patients in that time of um, the stress, this, this is, um, to, to, to have that sense of living things is, is very uh, reassuring and creates a nurturing environment. You don't always have to have green things and, and the other thing, once you start looking at this biophilic um, body of literature and start thinking this way, wherever you go you'll see biophilic thinking or you won't see it and this is um, uh, at Turanga, the new um, Christchurch Public Library and I just thought these staircases are like um, branches of a tree and they, 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 they really you know, show some of those biophilic design principles. And you get your, the, this is a famous uh, uh, wall in Paris that's uh, um, designed by Patrick Blanc, it's kind of at the art end of the spectrum of biophilic design high upkeep, I'm very sure, really expensive, but it's this, it's this wall that's, that, that's it's a living vertical, <coughs> vertical garden. 
and uh, we've seen some images of the <laughs> Bosco Verticale in Milan, um, which they in these in these towers there's something like um, 800 trees and the, um, I think altogether something like 15,000 plants. So it's, it's a vertical forest. This is a building I thought I wanted to show. It's being built currently. I spoke to the architect who's involved in the design here. It's, it's a new um, uh, building for the um, Royal College of Physicians in Liverpool. It's, it's a biophilic design and it's also built to the wellness standard. It includes a lot of biophilic design principles and with greenery, but also um, all sorts of interesting things like variable airflow, natural airflow, um, and so on. And what's, what's really interesting about this building is that there's absolutely nothing in it that hasn't got an evidence base. Um, even the width of a doorway would have several papers behind it. So it's, it's a monument to an evidence base, which I thought is really interesting, com combining the wellness, the biophilic design, and then that, that evidence base uh, informing every, every, every tiny decision about the building. And then you get, um, this is a building company in France at, at, at a different scale. They, they offer 18 different ways to make your buildings more ecologically um, friendly or bring in biophilic design. Um, you've got a green roof there, um, you've got a picture of an insect hotel and, and you've got some pictures of some bird nesting boxes. Now these, they've, they've got a lot of expert zoologists and ecologists in to design these things. So you can choose a whole lot of elements to bring into your building to support the native wildlife. And I have to go to Singapore. We always end up in Singapore pretty quickly when we, when we look at these topics. This is a hospital, another hospital in Singapore called Ku Tek Puat Hospital. It brings in energy efficiency and, and, and um, passive um, natural ventilation as well as uh, solar power energy, but most of all it brings in biodiversity at a really significant level. So for example, um, that stormwater lake has been part of the hospital's reconstruction to, and it provides habitat for some 90 fish species. Um, they have something like 70 um, different bird species and 80 different butterfly species and they're very proud of this, it's very, very much celebrated and um, they also have a roof garden and this is a really extensive roof garden that pro that's a community farm um, that provides produce for um, the hospital as well as the community and it's essentially a, a, a place where the, uh, the local community gathers, it provides, a, 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 as well as you know, patients can experience the intense greenness of that environment. So these ideas obviously can all be extended to and scaled up to the biophilic cities and we've seen lots of examples of biophilic cities and th these are, this is um, Gardens by the Bay in Singapore and um, Singapore is one of these cities that is really, really leading in this, in this respect. About 50% of Singapore is, is actually green and they, um, it, it, they, if in many parts, if you're building a building you've, and you're removing greenery at the ground level, you've got to replace it at another level. So there are lots of green roofs and vertical walls, uh, vertical gardens, um, and they really celebrate this, this, the, the biodiversity um, and people's connection with it. So they create lots of opportunities for people to interact with the environment and experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, such as these walkway, walkways that connect different suburbs and, um, and they will also commuter ways between suburbs and you can literally hang out on a, on a Sunday uh, afternoon like these teenagers at the tree, in the treetop <laughs> level. So it's about connecting people with that ecology. Now, you, you see these visible connections for people, but there's a lot of the design that actually connects ecological corridors at different levels for other species to move through the city. So there's a lot of deliberate design for that to accommodate the needs of other species. Stormwater drains like this are common in many big cities. And one of the things that, that's happening all over the world is the removal of these um, essentially engineered linear structures. And in Singapore, in this one park, they, they removed the, the stormwater canal and created a, essentially a wetland environment that um, provides this amazing amenity value be between, between these high-rise buildings and, su and supports a lot of biodiversity, including a, a family of otters that has just moved into, into <coughs> that um, uh, wetland. We've spoken a bit about green roofs. This is in Toronto, and obviously when you green a roof, you, you deal with heat island effects, you create 
um, habitat for species, you improve the air quality, you improve the water runoff and so on. So you get multiple benefits and this whole idea of multiple benefits I think is uh, one of the themes that comes through when we, when we look at this, especially from a, a public health point of view. Melbourne is a city that's um, committed to increasing its tree canopy, tree canopy cover from 20% to 40%. And one of the main reasons for doing this is a, a health reason. It's about dealing with heat waves in the future, especially as climate warms up. Um, the adaptation here is to increase the, the tree canopy cover. Trees in, 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 in Melbourne also each have their own email address and you can, you can email them and um, people send messages and love letters to their favourite trees. Um, now there's also the, there's an upside to this whole biophilic approach and that is in backyard gardening. Things like lawns are ecological deserts so you, know, you can dig up your lawn and um, start planting things that support native species, birds and pollinators and so on. And one trick to do this is to put up a sign that says you're doing a wildlife garden because then people don't look at you strangely for not mowing your lawn. And, um, but this, this, is, this is a project in, in the UK and they're really finding that you know, it's, it's, um, once you, you start communicating what you're doing with your, your space, and we've all, most of us have some space to do this kind of thing, um, you know, you can, pe people get really enthused about it and you get a lot of community support for it. This is an urban garden in France, um, near, uh, in Versailles. So an area that was derelict that is now being farmed, it's collecting water from neighbouring rooftops to, to, and it's collecting coffee grounds and it's mixed with straw to, to compost and, 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 um, and provide nutrients for the very diverse plantings there that are that they're, they're trees and, and leaf vegetables, root, root, root vegetables, as well as a lot of um, plantings that support um, wildlife, insects. And you can obviously take that kind of thing out onto the streets. So this urban gardening is another part that's another theme that's part of this um, biophilic movement. And um, as we start looking at how we can transform tr street space, we've always, you know, we kind of think of streets as places for cars to move up and down. We can start imagining streets to be different. And this is quite a, a simple photo, really, that's just showing in Copenhagen a, a street that's actually sort of being. Um, um, becoming a social space so people have moved a table into it and cars are no longer quite as dominant in this space and obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of bicycles and um, active, active transport as well. Oslo is a city that about two-thirds of the, the city footprint is natural environment and it's got an extensive, extensive ne network of cycleways and, and, and walk, walking trails. 85% of children in, in Oslo get to school either act by active transport on no, cycling, walking, or using public <coughs> transport. Um, and they're also looking at day, the daylighting of rivers. So that's another theme that comes through with a lot of this work, this idea that we've had, we've got rivers in many cities that run under them. Um, so <coughs> Fle Fleet Street is named after the River Fleet, but you won't see that river anywhere there. Um, it'll be underneath. And um, in, in, so in Oslo, um, I think they're about seven rivers that they, they've got projects for daylighting them, bringing them to the surface, making them living ecosystems and usable rivers again. Anchorage is another um, city that celebrates its nature. They have something like a thousand moose, 300 um, black bears and 65 brown bears, I think it is, that, that they share the city with and they've got, ex again, extensive cycleways and this is one of my favourite photos because it's about that, that human connection and experience. I just love it. This, this kid's obviously come round the corner on a cycleway and encountered a moose. And I think that these kind of experiences also um, capture that idea of, of um, awe. You know, and that, you know, when we in interact with nature, especially this kind of nature, there's that sense of awe. And there's, there's actually a body of science emerging around the need for awe and the benefits of awe. In our in our life, um, have to mention Wellington. So Wellington is actually a biophilic city, and for good reason. It's got a lot of um, uh, green areas, and they're doing uh, they do really well on public transport. They're working on their blue belts, their marine marine areas as well. Um, if Tauranga had the same public transport as Wellington did, we would have something like 50 fewer premature deaths each year. So there's a direct um, public health benefit for taking these approaches. 
And obviously, you know, they've got Zealandia, um, which is you know, helping um, threatened species and at-risk and at -risk species like the kaka, for example, get re-established in the city. So it's bringing wildlife back into the city. And there are projects such as, um, this is the, the White Tangy Park down near the waterfront. And essentially, it's, um, you know, this is providing a, um, cleaning of the water before it goes back, storm water before it goes back into the harbour. It's creating habitat, it's creating green space, it's helping that heat island effect and so on. So you're getting those multiple benefits. And I have to mention um, art. This is downtown Wellington, and you've got this giant kina. So, um, and this invokes this idea of biomimicry, and I, I suspect others might talk a bit more about biomimicry, but this idea of copying nature. And on this idea of biomim biomimicry, I think we're starting to open up a whole lot of thinking about technological solutions for the future as well. So, for example, um, there's a glass building behind there, and you know, the technology is emerging such as use the glass that can um, generate no solar power, so we can start you know, cladding our buildings and in, in you know, our glass buildings with uh, that are then they can start producing their own energy. So we start getting to this biomimicry idea where we we create these closed ecology or closed uh, economies where buildings might create their own energy and manage their own wastes and so on. And we certain there's some examples of you know, um, street paving. This is an experimental street in. Uh, near Atlanta in Georgia, that's it's essentially there's an EV charging station there, but the street um, charges, the, the, the cladding, of the, the paving on the street charges that, <coughs> that um, <coughs> charging station. Um, so biofit cities are cities that contain abundant nature, they are cities that care about, seek to protect, restore and grow <coughs> this nature and strive to foster deeper connections and daily contact with the nat natural world. Nature is not something optional, but absolutely essential to live a happy, healthy, and meaningful life. And in biophilic cities, residents care about nature and work on its behalf locally and globally. How do we interpret this all from a public health perspective? Well, first of all, there's a huge amount of evidence around um, the health benefits of connection with nature. <coughs> this is a recently published Oxford textbook of nature and public health. It's on the table or somewhere in the building, hopefully. Um, but it, the, it's just trying to capture this whole emerging body of evidence around um, the benefits of nature and health. And um, uh, many of these have been mentioned. Uh, just sp specifically for children, there are a whole lot of benefits in terms of um, physical de development, social development, cognitive development and school performance. So schools that have more trees, kids do better. And this is accounting for all other differences as well. But also, interestingly, managing stressful events in childhood. Um, and there's, there's a significant amount of literature on this. Um, Sharon Cox in his, in, from Toyota has summarized a whole lot of it. So we've got a great body of evidence that, uh, that we can start using. If we apply these principles to public health, uh, first of all, it's about transforming how, uh, what our relationship with nature is. It's about love, awe, and respect, <coughs> and celebration of nature. I guess in health, we've been doing lots of conquering of nature over you know, decades or centuries, and we've probably overdone the conquering side, you know, and it's now time to start s switching to a more nurturing approach, recognizing the value of nature for health. Nature is not something optional, but it's essential to be happy, healthy, and, and have a meaningful life. And it's about enhancing that day-to-day -day interaction and connection with nature. So if we take a public health approach to um, um, to this. We, we're looking for benefits for people directly, but also indirectly in the future through, for example, mitigating the effects <coughs> of climate change. And at the same time, we want our public health actions to benefit other species and ecosystems and do it at multiple scales. So I, I think this is best captured in this idea of health for all. Health for all is an idea that's been around in, in public health for a long time, since 1978 essentially with the declaration of Alma Ata, which where health for all was about access to primary health care for everybody. It was it's this idea that everybody had a right to access the health care that they needed. And I think what we need to do now as we get into the 21st century and we're starting to transform our models of how we think about this, we need to think of health for all as health for all species. So that, that's a picture of the phylogenetic tree of life. It's like a schematic of the, the, the genetic family of life of all species. 
and um, no, it represents the approximately 8.7 million, I think is the best estimate of the number of species, give or take 1.3 million on the planet. Um, and just, just for reference, that's where we are. Um, but so we need to think about health for all now as this idea of health for all species. And I think Biophilic Cities provides that kind of health for all approach. It's uh, firstly, it, you know, it nurtures, nurtures and cherishes nature. We start prioritizing ecological repair and restoration. And, um, but then we also um, start looking at these other factors such as social capital, engagement and volunteering because a lot of the biophilic cities initiatives uh, um, focus on this uh, and um, um, are driven by volunteers. We have to have an increasing focus on equity and this is a strong emerging theme in, in the discussions. If we, we need to start thinking about um, access to nature and experience of nature as an essential good just like water, drinking water is, and, and we need to design our cities so that everyone has that kind of access uh, to nature because of the benefits that it has for public health. It includes walkability, active transport, urban food production, urban gar uh, gardens and orchards and so on and it's inspired and, and mimics nature and we need to do it at multiple scales. In public health we can apply this to food. <coughs> if we look at what's healthy, typically um, no, this is a food pyramid so um, we've got the fruits and veggies and so on at the bottom and the, the meat and sweet stuff at the top and um, if we match it to a pyramid of what, what creates an ecological footprint, it, fortunately it matches really well. So as we eat, if we, if we follow a plant-based plant -based diet with small amounts of meat, if any, we actually reduce our ecological footprint and then we can include a lot of other aspects that make our food policies um, better for, for the planet as well. We can look at transport quite differently and this is a bit of just a bit of a brainstorm, we can't see the details on that about how we can think about transport. But if we take a biophilic approach we can think of a whole lot of different ideas. Obviously active transport, multimodal transport, um, renewable electric powered transport. Uh, we can start thinking about the permeability of road surfaces, not having so much tar seal that takes up 25% to 40% of some cities. Um, we st if our transport can create habitat, we can start looking at ecological corridors. Edmonton is a city that's got something like 27 ecological corridors where, um, that's, that are designed for wildlife to move around the city. Um, so we can look at how transport doesn't disrupt those but even enhances those kind of corridors for our wildlife. We can look at street space as social space and we start, start thinking of things like soundscapes. Um, I think one of the great benefits of the electric vehicle revolution is that we'll, we'll no, we'll get quieter nights, which has quite profound impacts for health and cardiovascular health. And we start looking at things like dark sky sanctuaries as well, which have also significant impacts for health. We're looking at all our programs, so workplace, we do a well, workplace wellness program, we're looking at how we include some of these concepts in there. I'm going quite fast now because I'm getting the signal from Nikki at the back. Um, we're looking at how we include these concepts into our work with ECE. So we've got a program that includes about 60 ECEs and um, how we bring in these concepts into those, that program. I did want to get to this one last slide because I think this is actually really important. It's, 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 just, it's, it's not a picture, it's just got some interesting words on it, words we use a lot. And we've got words like environment, sustainability, conservation, reserves, parks, natural resources. These are all part of the language we use around this area. And I think we need to modify our language actually and start bringing in other concepts that reflect these ideas but actually reflect a transformation in our, in our values. And so, I mean, environment is a very depersonalizing, de it's a very kind of amorphous term and we need to start recognizing the wealth of species and habitats and, um, and ecosystem diversity. I, th I think biomimicry is a word that we're going to use to replace sustainability. I, for me, sustainability, maybe it's just personal, it, doesn't, it leaves me pretty, it doesn't inspire me at all. It sounds like an accounting spreadsheet thing. Um, but biomimicry uh, has got imagination and we start looking at how we design things that, that mimic natural processes. Instead of conservation, we're in an era of ecological restoration and we'll be hearing a lot more about that <coughs> later on. Um, rewilding cities, rewilding places, not thinking about nature, something out there somewhere else, but actually it, it's everywhere around us. And instead of natural resources, no, use words like biodiversity. 
And it's about change of values, um, love, awe, and respect of nature in, in our decision making. And I think most of all, hope. Um, um, two years ago, I was really depressed reading all the reports around biodiversity loss. And since I actually heard a talk from Bruce Clarkson in Rotorua introducing me to this biophilic cities idea, you mentioned it there at the Royal Society speech, it's, it's a really hopeful um, and optimistic um, vision of what the future can be. Thank you, I think I've gone slightly over time. <laughs>